All right. Um, so hello, everyone, um, to this update demo of CutMate. Um, last night, I released a new version. Um, some of the features um, have been sitting in there already a little bit, so you, some of that might not be new to you in terms of what you've seen in the interface already. As usual, just ask questions right away if they come up. And uh, although I uh, meant to include another big feature um, into this release, uh, the MPLAS support, uh, I guess Michael's really waiting for it. <laughs> uh, didn't make it in, unfortunately, since I had to fight some stupid bugs on the end. I didn't want to risk it, this last minute thing. But there's going to be another update pretty soon, which will contain that, which then eventually will you finally allow you to compare neurons uh, for similarity between uh, other neurons, but hopefully also to LM data. Um, but more on that once it's actually in there, and I can show something about it. So um, let's stick to this version's changes. May, oops, maybe make this a little bit. Ah, all right, okay. Oh, or maybe not like that. Okay, well then like that. Okay, so um, first changes are uh, we're done in the volume manager, as you might have seen. So that's uh, the FFB v14 uh, production instance. I'm um, going to use that as usual as an example. So in the volume manager, um, you now have a few more controls over here, which allow you to intersect volumes with uh, neurons or skeletons. Um, so one thing you can do for each volume now is you have these buttons in here uh, to list all the skeletons or all the connectors within a particular volume. Um, so for instance, you could now say, show me all the volumes in this uh, um, volume here, right? I just randomly picked one. So there's 63 neurons in there, but uh, if we want to constrain that a little bit more to say everything that is 100 micron, uh, 100 thousand nan uh, nanometers, so 100 micron, yep. Um, we could constrain that list a little bit more. I guess I just picked now a volume that is bigger than the other one. So let's wait for a second until it's there. But you get the idea, right? You can also constrain that uh, by node count, but typically length is, of course, more useful. And so let me go back to the other one because I was quicker to load. So yeah, OK. So we constrain that a little bit. Let's constrain that maybe a little bit more by doing that. OK, now we got only less of 10, right? You get the idea. You can also additionally constrain your search by another, another skeleton source. So if you're looking for a particular set of neurons intersecting with volumes, you can do, uh, use any uh, skeleton source in here, right? So the same, obviously, is true for um, the connectors. So let's stick to the same volume. Whatever is within that volume is being picked. Right, but uh, to be clear, it is whatever intersects with that volume, right? So, um, so what happens here is that if you open this, uh, so this selection for let me see, yeah. So right now it's even like that. That for the connect uh, for the skeletons, it only tests for intersection for the bounding box of a volume. It's gonna, uh, that changed already in the development version so that a filter, a front and filter is applied already so that you actually got the actual near, uh, volume as intersection partner. Um, this is, hmm? Is not contained within the volume? Um, like completely contained, you mean? Even partially. Um, that's, that's, so that's uh, not in that version. It's already in the dev version that a front end filter is already applied. So if we, were to open a 3D viewer now and pick, um, yeah, that's selection one, those, those 10 neurons, and also open, uh, is it the volume? I think we picked that one. Or did we pick that one? Yeah, so that's a fairly small volume somewhere over here, but happens to have quite some intersections with uh, all these capos here. I guess you can't even see it. 
Let's make that a little bit brighter. So since currently the test only happens with a bounding box, it intersects more than uh, what is actually intersecting the volume. But what you can do is uh, add a filter manually. So this is what happens in the development version um, with the next update. It's going to happen here too, that for the selection table, you only get those uh, intersecting with the actual value, uh, volume, be it fully contained or be it partially contained. Um, and then will you be able to, to choose uh, between partially and fully contained? I can make that an option, yeah. Okay, let me note that. Um. All right. Um, this. Uh, I try to use the skeleton constraints for this. Every time I run it to list skeletons, I get a 503 error. Is that true? Yeah. With the, oh, let's just try that. Um, so let's maybe, so no, I haven't seen that. Um, that would be new back. So let's maybe have all but one, uh, have only one in here and constrain that by selection two. Uh, well, it be because of like uh, too many skeletons, would that cause an error? Possibly, but what is too many? Like how many did you? Uh, maybe like 650 or so. You should be able to deal with that, but uh, I'm gonna try and, and see with a bigger set. Okay. Um, let me quickly take a note. Um, okay, but this uh, filtering with uh, the actual volume and not only the bounding box happens already with the connectors, so if you list the connectors here, uh, it will only be those connectors that are contained in the actual volume, not the bounding box. Um, so let's maybe keep those skeletons as an example and see where we going to go next. Um, right, we talked about that, and also um, you can now say since there are more options now available in the volume manager, you can save the state and have a default configuration for your volume manager. Um, just a reminder, you can do that by oh, make some space here. Uh, opening the little panel up here uh, with the window icon and save the settings. Or if you, uh, so that makes only sense if you don't have that automatic saving of state for each widget uh, checked, or if you have it not checked, uh, otherwise it will be saved automatically, right? Um, okay, so much for volume manager. Uh, 3D viewer. Uh, underwent quite a few changes. Um, first and foremost, uh, it's now finally possible on other platforms than Linux to adjust the line width. That's been a long-standing issue. So if we now import these, and now this is a Linux machine, so I guess I can't really <laughs> prove it to you, but um, you see, um, if you go now in the view settings here, you got this new uh, checkbox volumetric lines, and if that is enabled, uh, it will apply the actual line width, right? So if I, I can now bump this up, and it looks funny, um, but all the shadings, all the color modes should work as well. So let's maybe scale that a little bit back. And if you uncheck that, it will have the old behavior. Because currently, as a caveat to that, if you export SVGs, you still need to use the old uh, rendering mode. Uh, I didn't have had time yet to update the SVG rendering to do that automatically. So if you need to export SVGs um, or a catalog SVG, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, make sure to uh, enable the or disable the volumetric lines. It will also warn you. So if you 
Is it now enabled? So just to, okay. If you were to export SVGs, it will warn you here that it needs that volume matrix lines disabled. Okay. Um, and have, has any one of you tried that out on a, on a Mac or Windows computer? Does that work as expected? Mac works. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great, excellent. Okay, then a, just a small detail. Um, if you have a, let me zoom in a little bit. Um, you can now more easily focus the active skeleton and by clicking, oops. This focus skeleton button here. If you do that, the, act, the center of mass of the active skeleton will be used to, as the camera focus point, right, where you like circle around. And, but I quickly want to adjust the textual representation of my neurons since I set it to all annotations, which makes it a little bit noisy. So, okay. Now, next thing, um, you can if you have volumes that seem to coarse for you. Maybe if you want to make a figure or so, you can now uh, subdivide those volumes. And so let's maybe, and that's it. So if you uh, first make some space. So if you would want to render this more nicely, you can now um, click on subdivide here. It will think about it and then make a more uh, smooth mesh out of it. Um, that's mainly relevant for figures, so filtering and all that isn't affected by that uh, because it doesn't make much difference. And you can show the bounding box if you want, if that is of any help. Um, uh, yeah, so, but for nicer volumes, for ni more nicely rendered volumes, you can do that. Um, okay, bounding box is there. Well, no, if you, it affects both. So it actually, so if you have a f faces enabled and subdivide, it will also make the, the whole thing more smooth, right? It doesn't look as meshy or <laughs> whatever it is, <laughs> less coarse. Um, okay, but it's more like a visual thing, right? Um, then there are few new, oh, I actually have a mouse here, wait. Perfect. Um, then there are a few more coloring modes. We talked about that at the workshop. That would be nice to be able to render neurons similar as it is done in light data. And you can now color based on, the, on each dimension. So that's the Z dimension, right? And you have that for every, uh, for Y and for X as well. Right, so makes it sometimes easier to compare uh, so the same uh, lookup tables, color lookup tables are used and that are common with light data. Um, probably most common is the Z-based coloring, rainbow coloring. Um, and now I seem to have closed the change lock, just a second. Okay, then uh, minor change. It's been a problem sometimes in the past to follow the active node if you have radius information associated with a particular node. Um, so now this has changed to uh, a strategy where if you have a radius associated with a particular node, the active node will scale to one and a half times its size, so you can always see it on top of the rest, right? Um, that's true for individual uh, spheres, but also for the more cylindrical uh, edge-based radius display. Um, so you should always be able to see the active node now. And if it is, for some reason, um, hidden because there are two volumes or two radius cylinders like meeting at a particular point, you can, just as a reminder, always say active node on top. That's a particular check here which makes, it make the, makes the active node rendering be always on top, regardless what the surrounding uh, morphology and geometry is. Yeah, Kathy? Sorry, the last one with the line width, I think no synapses are hard to see now. 
because of the volumetric lines. Um, Is that like true? If I, yeah, if I blow them up, the to-do tags, for example, get so big that it's hard to okay. distinguish between uh, to-do tags if they're close to each other. On my machine, the nodes disappeared on Synapse. Is that so? I remember you sending this email, Michael. Um, I yeah, I thought I fixed that because there was a problem yesterday at least, or the day before, um, where only one sphere of the whole set of spheres was actually rendered with that. So, yeah, exactly. And that made all the rest of the spheres uh, hard to see because they wouldn't be there in the first place. I had that problem this morning. So if you blow Okay, up so it's still there. Okay. Yeah. Blow up the node handling scale. Okay, let's do that. Oh, okay, interesting. So let's make this 10 or bigger. Oh, it's still okay, but like you, you, if you zoom out, you still can't see synapse as well. So I had it on like 30, and, and then you're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice cherry tree. <laughs> and my neurons, unfortunately, have a lot of to do. <laughs> okay, so it is more about uh, like the scaling of different sphere yeah. types. Than synapses, for example, mm -hmm. that would be helpful. Sure. Well, again, can just have uh, two yeah. different scaling factors. That is helpful. Let me take a note. And I don't know if that's just for me a problem, but I think the little um, uh, lines that go away from synapses didn't scale with the synapse. Surely looks like that. Yeah. Okay, right. The the scaling, the node handle scaling is actually applied only to the spheres, but yeah. you're right, it would make sense to also increase the, the little they flags. They basically disappear. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, okay. Right. Um, okay, I'm going to look into that. It uh, shouldn't be uh, hard to change. Let me, let me reduce it to something useful, uh, use, uh, usable. Okay, then I don't know if you have ever used that, and I talked a little bit about it on the workshop. There is this catalog export. Um, if you I'm not familiar with that. That's the button here, catalog SVG. And what it does is that it can take every neuron in a 3D viewer and provide a or generate a kind of table or grid like layout for all these neurons from the same perspective. So if we were to maybe zoom out a little bit and so that we can actually see all of them to make this a little bit more useful. And just a second. Maybe like that. You can now go in here. And first, um, before you didn't, we didn't use for sorting those uh, the neural name that's displayed everywhere, or that's gener which is generated. Um, and being able now to do that is useful because that way you can organize the order of your neur neurons in that grid layout, so that, for instance, you can divide by left and right or different means depending on how you uh, define your textual re representation of the neurons. So we just keep it like that for now. Um, it is now possible to include uh, the rendering of the 3D viewer as PNGs rather than SVGs, because if you have a lot of neurons in there, uh, it tends to generate a really big file, which is slow to load and hard to work with. You have different resolutions in here. If you uh, create a figure, maybe uh, it's useful to increase, uh, use a bigger view to make it being able to like zoom in more. But let's for now just do that and just give you an example of how this, what this actually looks like. It's now this, right? You have now this grid-like or table-like layout of all those neurons in the in a single SVG file, and what you can do. Also, as something that's new in here now is that you can have like multiple skeletons per panel. So let's say three, and it does something strange. Okay, that wasn't planned. Um, let's see. 
well, it worked at some point. Um, well, okay, it's got to look into that. But you're supposed to be able to have multiple neurons per panel now. Um, then also now possible is that if you enable the orthogonal views, uh, I mean the uh, orthographic mode, orthographic rendering, where there is no perspective transformation, um, you see there is a scale bar in here, uh, and now you can export that to uh, in here. If you select the scale bar, you can now uh, render this exact same scale bar into this catalog export. Um, let's see, is there more for those? Okay, just a minor detail. If you've been using this z-plane rendering here, where you would see the actual image data, one potential danger with this is changing the resolution to something like three and it would load all the tiles in that particular uh, zoom level uh, into the 3D viewer, which typically, with this zoom level, crashes your, uh, your browser since it's just too much image data. So what the 3D viewer now does, if it thinks you are loading more than a randomly picked 100 megabytes, it will just ask for confirmation so that you don't accidentally do that and destroy all your windows uh, at once. So typically, you probably want to have this more as uh, at a high, uh, higher resolution, right? And which is still can still be a lot of data. Okay, uh, questions with respect to the three D viewer. Um, with the the way you have the scale bar, is it would it be possible to add something that gives you your X Y Z uh, sort of like would rotate the X Y Z to let you know what directionality you're looking at something? Yeah, that's a yeah that would be useful. And not the first time this comes up. Um, just like in the in the corner, a little uh, three little axes that rotate with you. Uh, yeah. Okay. I have it so that you can have either the scale bar or the the uh, coordinates or both, so that each one has a checkbox would be great. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that should be doable. I probably would just place it in the lower right corner so that both can be there at the same time. Right. Um, okay, small changes to the connectivity matrix. Um, let's close this for now. And just append, let's append the 10 neurons that we loaded initially. Uh, just to both the rows and the columns. That's a regular mat matrix. And what what was actually the change? Uh, oh yeah, right. We can apply node filters. So usual thing, right? The the funnel icon up here, and uh, filter selection and so on. And then only the connector nodes included in that filter uh, will be rep respected by the table. Um, then um, maybe. More useful if you you can now easily group neurons if they have the same name into a group and uh, to make them have the same name uh, you would go in the settings widget and use this annotations uh, setting here for the textual representation of neurons so a very simple case uh, would be to just say well let's them all let uh, let's name them all test. Um, Alternatively, you can choose like base, uh, naming based on annotations uh, of various forms. So if you have now named them the same way, you can, oops, let me make some space, um, just group them rows and columns individually. Um, and the sums will uh, be, reflect those group values accordingly. Um, also, the connectivity matrix now saves state as well, so you can have a default set of configuration values in there. Um, okay, these were only small scale updates there. Let me quickly reset the, the naming 
just in case you don't know that, you can always reset values to the default uh, by clicking here. There should be a button. Yeah, OK. So everything back to normal. Um, now, reconstruction sampler. Um, Um, has gotten a few new features uh, with respect to interval creation. So I guess if you use a sampler, you've already noticed this new checkbox uh, drop-down menu up here. So far, we've always had the problem um, that we couldn't handle little twigs or leaf segments in the sampler. So the default behavior so far was always ignore leaf segments. Because if we divide up the nodes in intervals, maybe a little bit is left over and we can't associate that or it wouldn't fit the interval length that we've set, right? So by default, we just ignored those segments and, oh, that's right. Just randomly pick that. So, um, and you see there are all these gray little areas here which we would miss otherwise. And, now we have multiple options to deal with that. We can either um, create, let me start uh, with the last element, we can uh, either create shorter intervals based on that, right? If we do that, uh, if we do that, we would, it would look a little bit like that. All the little twigs are now their own intervals in the sampler. Um, that's maybe not always what you want, depending on, uh, well, how you want to, your intervals basically, or the um, distribution of interval length basic, basically to look like, right? If you have great shorter intervals, you suddenly have a large set of those small, small intervals. You can also just merge them into the last segments. This doesn't work, however, for twigs. So if you have a niche uh, where a little twig like branches off, there is no last interval because intervals by definition have to be non-branching. So a little twig isn't, wouldn't really fit into that. That's why there is this option, which allows you to merge it if possible, and if not, just create a new interval, which is of shorter length then. Um, currently, as I noticed this morning, there's still a bug in there, so if I preview, there's an error. It will, however, create the intervals correctly. So if we would go through with that and create the intervals that would merge into the last segment, or last interval, uh, it would, would do the correct thing. I just have to fix the visualization here. Okay, and then you also notice probably, and people told me already that with this release, um, the interval table got much slower, right? Uh, that's something I fixed already in dev, and if we, so if we open just randomly a, uh, a sampler here, you notice there is now the cable length of that domain displayed, and there is also for each interval, now if we open that and wait a little bit, the waiting is new, uh, you see also the cable length displayed for each interval, and also a uh, sum of all the completed intervals up here. Um, and the problem uh, is that now this computation makes it much slower. I did a stupid mistake when implementing that, and that's fixed already, and it's fast again once I update the server again. But now this information is there, and you get a better idea of how, what percentage maybe of uh, your intervals that are completed are, now you see, right? And depending on the leaf segment handling type, you see a lot of small segments or not. And you see that here it's like 28,000 nanometers weight is uh, already completed out of uh, much more. So there's work to do, left to do here, right? But you get a better, better idea of how, where are you at. So maybe it would make sense even to also display that ratio in there, I don't know. Would that be useful? Okay. Okay. And would that ratio only be uh, informative for completed intervals or for, any, for other states as well? Okay. All right. Okay. So 
yeah, these were the changes for reconstruction sampler. Any questions with respect to that? Okay, let's move on um, to some changes to the tracing layer, which uh, can be helpful if you trace remotely, be it in the UK or just not in that building, or have larger field of views. Uh, so far, uh, the default behavior was that if you move or pan in your view, you would update continuously. So there is this new settings in the layer controls, if you, which you can open with this little blue white box in the lower left corner, right? And for the neuron tracing layer, you have the setting update tracing data when panning. That's been true so far all the time. That is when you move, it will constantly update and will feel kind of laggy, right? And you can now disable that and pan more smoothly and only once you stop, it will actually go and update. Um, also, um, what you can do in here now is apply so-called tracing window, it's what I called, which basically reduces uh, the field of view that is used to query node data or tracing data uh, from the server so that if you, for instance, are reviewing a, new, a neuron, you don't necessarily need to load everything, look at everything, you maybe can, you can only focus at a particular area in uh, the center. So if we were to apply that and oh yeah, so it is applied. Let's make this a little bit smaller maybe. Okay, now it's a little bit in the, yeah, you see now it, now it's much faster to actually browse through, especially for reviewing, this can be uh, useful. And there's actually also a little green border drawn around it, but uh, uh, yeah, the small stupid thing prevents that from being displayed right now, but next update will this make, so that you can be aware that there is actually this filtering going on. So let's disable that again. So this is, uh, I believe, useful for people tracing remotely. Um, also, maybe relevant if you deal with a lot of small fragments, like it is, for instance, the case on the Google uh, FFB, FFB segmentation data set, you can now say that you only want to, view, that want to view the, I don't know, 100 largest neurons in your current field of view, and it will be uh, much sparser, right? And all these connectors are connected to nodes, so they seem to be connected to large skeletons here. Right? And you can, oh, no wrong button, adjust your view that way as well. Um, if you want to skip all the small fragments for whatever reason. Um, and if you set that back to zero, it is basically disabled. Okay. And now some uh, miscellaneous features. I don't know if you ever used that. The first one talks about control modifier together with uh, comma and period sign. Um, so if you use that, you can basically, oh, let me maybe enable this tracing window again to not load so many notes. So typically, so if you press, or if you hold comma or period sign, uh, Continuously, nothing will really happen, but if you press control, you can kind of browse through it. And so far, the behavior was that it wouldn't wait until everything is loaded, both the image data and the uh, tracing data. Now it's doing that by, by default. Uh, if you want the previous behavior back, you can um, adjust this in the settings widget by looking for, wait, animate section change by default. So if you do that, it won't wait with control pressed, but that's more uh, uh, of a minor feature. It's more interesting if you like make large steps through the data set to get an idea of how it looks like. Um, also interesting, you can now, in the connectivity widget, let me close that. you can now sample uh, filter by annotations as well. This was possible before already. If in some sense, if you use the or change the textual representation of the neurons to 
include the annotations or a subset of those annotations, but uh, this can be quite noisy, right? If I now enable that, you see all the neural names become uh, quite verbose, and we can now change, say, what is an annotation in there. Um, say optic, optic lobe, for instance, here. We do that. Uh, and maybe change the textual representation back. Uh, yeah, there is some filtering going on. You see there are 440 roughly neurons that are hidden due to this filter. And this can be applied per table. Um, another small detail in the split and merge dialog. No worries, I'm not going to split here. But if you hover over uh, the length, you now see the number of nodes. That's sometimes helpful. Um, also, more small workflow thing. If you reviewing neurons, you see this new uh, this new column here. Uh, which just indicates for that particular segment the last year. So, so you get a better idea if, or there's some likelihood that if you are the last user in that segment that you actually trace this whole thing out. So you maybe can focus on segments that you didn't trace um, um, depending on your workflows that might apply to you or not. Um, right, but it's there. Also, to explain, oops, that point, you can now set a cable length limit if you are tracing and know, for instance, that you don't want that a particular part of a neuron or the whole neuron can't be larger than some number. You can now get have CADMIT warn you if you step over that uh, number. So if we um, create a new neuron, or let's quickly enable that warning to show you where that is. Down here in the warning section, you can say, warn me if my neuron is bigger than 100 nanometers, which is fairly small, of course. But if I now were to create that, you see uh, warnings popping up that the neuron I'm working on is bigger than that. Um, sometimes that's useful uh, for, or the motivation for that feature was that um, you only want to trace out a neuron partially. To comp so there was a, a little project to compare the manual tracing to segmentation data, and that should was to happen in a very constrained area. Um, that's what this was used for. So I guess in regular tracing, um, you wouldn't use that so often. Um, let me quickly remove that neuron again. Okay, last points. Um, just a, new, uh, a small aspect that we talked uh, briefly through in the last uh, meeting. It was that when you apply, when you have node filters, let's just uh, add this, a random filter here. You can set a neural name that this filter is applied uh, is applied to, and now you can. And so far, it's been the case that you had to specify the full neural name exactly, but now you can also use just fragments of it so that if you, well, I guess hard to tell now if that actually, since they all have neuron in there. But you get the idea, I don't have to put in like LP neuron something, uh, but can only match on fragments too. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's also uh, just a small detail for the neural name display. We've seen that a couple of times here already, uh, which is that setting to configure the textual representation. If you have multiple components in here that, that end up in the same naming components, say you have all annotations and uh, oops, only your own annotations, um, it is easy to end up with the same annotation next to each other, right? If, um, because your annotation is part of all, all annotations. And so this would show up twice in the neural name. You can prevent this now, or it's prevented by default, uh, if the same field is showing next to each other. So maybe we can, we 
can do a small example. Oops. Let's annotate that with test. And uh, so okay, now you see, uh, so I'm sure you know that, but you can format the name of the neuron uh, in various ways. You can refer to those items in that list directly by using those numbers. And if you, and I now refer to own annotations and all annotations uh, together as a neuron name, and you can now remove those duplicates that would exist if I use them as is uh, automatically. Um, okay, and those uh, aspects uh, typically don't, or don't concern with the front end. If you use the API to do some scripting with the CADMATE back end, you can now uh, provide Boolean parameters like true and false in case insensitive manner, which wasn't the case before and led to some confusion. And uh, these two bullet points are about an export feature on the back end, so won't go into detail there. And uh, that's it about the new features and changes. There are a couple of bug fixes, but I won't go through them in detail now. Are there any questions or suggestions and comments? I haven't looked into that yet. I don't think uh, it actually takes long. And uh, like I said, one workaround would be uh, to, uh, because you, you wanted to add to um, intervals, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So currently, the the sampler, uh, in case you are not aware of that, uh, has some limitations on where you can continue intervals. Currently, that is that you can't add to an interval on the start node or the end node of an interval, and that leads to some problems. If you missed a branch, for instance, or you, you, you start a sampling a neuron, and you realize you, you missed a branch, and you need to connect that to a branch point, that's not possible currently. Uh, however, uh, that will be possible, that it will just, a new, this new part of neuron that you missed and now want to add to it, will be added to the last segment. Um, I think that is something that should work and shouldn't take a uh, long time. So yeah, should be there soon. Echo? Uh, what's the current implementation of shift click through volumes of spaces enabled? Uh, so I, I noticed you can shift click to like nodes of synapses or meta nodes. It doesn't appear that you can shift click to the actual scale of it. You should. Really? It's, it's, just, yeah, it's, it's a little bit harder to hit it because it's a yeah. smaller area. Yeah, so now it should be easier. No, uh, uh, I haven't used it with the new volume. Yeah. Right? It was possible before too, but it's way harder to, to click if you are not on Linux because yeah. then you had like super narrow. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Like this, I, I tried it this morning, like first thing. Was yeah. Like, Way better now. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, I randomly click here, right, and... Uh, so even, even through a volume, so... That's well, volume, that's always Let's see. somewhat funky, because you usually <laughs> hit the volume better than you hit the skeleton. Yeah, this is what I'm referring to. But yeah, because I, I can shift-click fine, usually. Yeah, yeah. I'm specifically through a volume. Ah, okay, so that's what you did in the past, like enabling a volume and then clicking on that, or...? No, so so he basically wants to still click on the skeleton, but... With the volume there. Yeah, yeah. You kind of end in the volume. Right. If I now do that, for instance, he would want to go to the place... Okay, yeah. Um, I don't know how much sense it makes actually to end up in the volume. There should, it should probably be a thing you can enable or disable. Probably not the default behavior then? Yeah. Okay, got it. it. To end up in, in the... 
outside of the right. Okay. Right. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Yeah. No. By default, now it respects the volumes and will go to that location that you hit on the volume. But I see that's not. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Let me note that. Um. Okay. 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 Also, mark the to do thing to have that done rather sooner than later. Okay. Anything else? I don't know how much sense it makes for others, but um, so I've been reviewing neurons that have been traced by somebody else um, and been working on those neurons. And I wonder how much people would like to only review stuff that's been traced by others. That there's like a checkbox or something where you can say, I only want to review tracings by not me. Okay. And what? So. So would that mean yeah. only segments? Would that be applied to whole segments that are reviewed or to individual nodes? Would you skip over nodes that you reviewed? I've if you, if like multiple people reviewed. So say I made a branch and then somebody added something and then I kept on working on that branch. Um, that's a good question. I, I it's, guess it could skip my tracing but give me a warning or something like that. Like just skip the couple of nodes that you trace or whatever. Okay. Well, I can certainly make that an option and yeah. say skip and warn. Yeah. Uh, On tracings. When, yeah. Because like the knowing who created the last node in that branch is already super helpful. But it would be great if I could still review whatever has been traced by somebody else in that branch. Right. Makes sense. And maybe that could be similar to the team review where you can add another person to your team and you don't review what they trace, for example. Okay, yeah, I see. Like well, yeah, I guess it would make sense to, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that would make sense to base this, uh, uh, maybe or provide both options for you and for your team. Well, I guess this can also probably. Uh, I mean, you have had to review that. I'm talking about what's traced by somebody else. Yeah. yeah no, I understood. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Andrew, are you still there? On. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Okay. Cool. Have you Try to find the bounding box of the entire neurofill mesh because it's just uh, it's my computer is struggling quite a bit of time managing to do it. Applying it as a node filter? What do you mean? Yeah, sorry, the uh, subdivide to. The oh, oh yeah, <laughs> that's a challenge. Yeah, <laughs> I have not, <laughs> but let's okay. kill the browser window and try. Uh, but I, I, I would imagine, like, if you, you see already for a volume like, like that. Yeah, I was able to do that in 10 loads. But, yeah, uh, yeah, here already it takes a second or so, and it is fairly small, right? Um, I can see if I can improve the performance of that. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't, but I also couldn't do faces anymore. Well, that works. So let's uh, make that a little bit bigger. So that works without problems. Um, but I suppose if I now click that, we can probably see the browser window freeze. Um, yeah. I did it. Did it actually? Oh, it did it. So yeah, see, wow, I didn't expect that actually. <laughs> Oh, hey, hey, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm impatient. Maybe that's it. Yeah. It didn't take so long. 
Okay, so it works, yeah. Great, and then my next question was with the, um, the kind of the myth coloring based on depth. Yeah. Is it possible to get that normalized to the actual, so that the, the breadth of the spectrum is normalized to the actual volume of neurons rather than the bounding box? Sure. So, um, I guess apply it to the, or normalize it to the bounding box of the volume, would that suffice? Or, yeah, or the, bound, or, or the actual distance that the neuron travels. So, uh, for instance, those cells I'm looking at right now, they do span a, a significant depth of the brain, but they don't go much past a green to a light blue. Okay. The depth is based on the actual... Um, yeah. Rather than the... Right. And you would want that, for instance, uh, like in this case here, that's now uh, the Z depth rainbow coloring is enabled. And you would want to have it to go like from blue to red, um, but only in the volume of the, the whole neural pill, right? Yeah, or the volume is the volume of the cell itself. That might be, let's say you're looking at oh, the volume. Oh, I see. Okay. Of where it goes in the anterior versus posterior glomerulus. Um, that's basically all going to be blue. Okay. Well, sure. Yeah. So I could. I guess there could be multiple modes, right? One where you, like you suggested, um, normalize to uh, the actual neuron, like the, the 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 distance it covers, right, and in, in the respective dimension. Yeah. Um, so, but then. This would then be different, basically, for every neuron, right? Yeah, it would be. Okay, good. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I can certainly do that. And since you mentioned volumes, would that be a... Uh, would you want only that, or also a mode where you would do that with respect to volumes extent? That's, that's interesting. That could be pretty handy if you're, if you're looking at a, a volume... Because then at least multiple neurons would be normalized to the same thing. Exactly. So it makes it more comparable. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, sure, I can add those two modes. And I guess for a volume-based uh, depth coloring, that would just need to be one option to select a volume that you would actually refer to. Or should that be just all the displayed volumes? I guess that would probably be easier, all the ones that are visible currently. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, okay, let me quickly note that. Um, okay. That's a good suggestion. Is there anything more from you guys? All right, then. Oh, was this a question? Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, okay. Thank you.